Good morning, everyone. If you could ask everyone to uh, grab a seat, please. We would appreciate it. So welcome to the launch of the Base 11 Space Challenge. I think you'll all agree with me that this is a very, very exciting day. My name is Al Bunchaft. I'm a senior vice president with Dassault Systems, and I've been given the honor to open the event and introduce the first speaker. I'm convinced, and I hope you are, that we're all going to look back on this day as a very, very significant event. I believe that we are at the edge of launching the next generation of innovators for the 21st century, and I think this event will be a key, key part of that. Um, so with that as a very brief introduction, I'd like to introduce a colleague of mine that I've been working with now for a few years. Landon Taylor is the CEO of Base 11. Uh, he has been uh, one of the um, brains behind launching this activity. Uh, incredible inspiration to me and I know many others of you. It's an honor for Dassault Systems to be partnering with Base 11 on a number of activities now. Uh, and to be part of this Base 11 Space Challenge. So with no further delay, I would like to welcome Landon Taylor to the podium. Landon. All right, thank you, Al. Are you guys fired up? Yeah. I, I know I am fired up. This day uh, has been coming. We've been excited. We've been working on it since September of last year. I got uh, inspired by reading the book Bold that gave the history of the Ansari X Prize, which of course created Virgin Galactic. And when I heard that story, I said, wait a minute, that's it. Let's, let's build and create the Base 11 Space Challenge. And so listen, before we get started, let me tell you who's in the room. Because at Base 11, one of our core strategies is to break down the silos that exist between academia, industry, philanthropy, and government. We want to break those silos down so that we can work together towards this common goal of accelerating high, accelerating high potential, low resource students into the victory circle so that they can achieve this goal of one, getting admitted to four-year university studying a STEM major, two, getting hired in a well-paid STEM job. I'm looking at my buddy from SpaceX. Number three, is for them to get trained as STEM entrepreneurs. And so we create the opportunity to break those silos down, and today's event is another example of doing that. Because let me tell you who's in the room. We have students from all over the United States and some students from Canada. We have industry leaders in our audience here with us representing great companies like SpaceX, Boeing, Dassault Systems, Firefly Aerospace, Sage Cheshire, Spin Launch, and then we have representatives from our government collaborators, including the FAA. Michelle Murray is here, you're gonna hear from her. Including the CEO of Spaceport America, that's a part of uh, New Mexico State, the state of Me New Mexico. Locally, we have Councilwoman Zarita from District 1, right here in Compton, who's here with us. And then from our nonprofit partners, major leaders from across the country, the XPRIZE Foundation is here. Sigma Pi Phi, the fraternity, is represented here. You'll hear from them in a moment. Teresa Price with National College Resources Foundation, Base 11, of course, and then a very special individual I want to recognize, and that's tomorrow's Aeronautical Museum. The founder, who is Robin Petgrave. See, you're in tomorrow's Aeronautical Museum. Many people ask me the question, why Compton? Why would you launch in Compton? I mean, I see some people laugh, like, yeah, I asked them that. Why Compton? You could have done it at one of your aerospace companies. You could have done it at one of the elite universities that you partner with. But we said, we want to walk the talk. We want to demonstrate an example of our commitment to bring access, awareness, and belief to students from all backgrounds, especially students from underrepresented communities. 
That's where, that's where I'm wrong. And we're doing it by bringing opportunities like this. Because our mission is to solve two of this country's most significant problems. One is this STEM talent pipeline crisis that's only getting worse because of the underrepresentation of women and students from underrepresented communities. And number two is a lack of a sustainable middle class in America made up of all Americans. And so therefore, we think space can be a great example to achieve those goals. Number one, there was a recent economic forecast done by Bank of America Merrill Lynch that forecasts the space industry to become worth over $2.7 trillion within thir the next 30 years. We believe that all communities deserve access to that opportunity, not just big business, government, and the ultra-rich. That's why we're going to level the playing field and create an opportunity for them all. Number two, maybe even bigger, then the economic opportunity is the ability to increase the opportunity for society overall. One of my good advisors, Greg Marinak, the co-founder of XPRIZE, shared with me, land and space will give our species access to a material and energy abundance while protecting and, and repairing the Earth's biosphere. Space gives us a chance to overcome the zero-sum scarcity gain that pervades the present economic mindset in the world. And see, I'm convinced that it's going to be innovators, student innovators, that are in this room with us and listening in on the live cast who are going to give us the answer to capture and move into abundance. And that's why today we're launching the Base 11 $1 million Space Challenge. Welcome to Base 11's $1 million Space Challenge. We're looking for the first university rocketry team who can build and launch a liquid fuel rocket that can reach an altitude of 100 kilometers, the edge of space. Space launches like SpaceX's Falcon Heavy have captivated our imaginations to dream of a new age in space travel. The opportunities are endless, but there's a huge problem. Several aerospace companies have told us that as much as 50% of their engineers will be eligible for retirement in the next 10 years. But graduates often have to spend their first five to seven years getting their real world training on the job before they can start adding value. The current model is just not working. That's why we've launched the Base 11 Space Challenge to empower hundreds of participating students nationally with the mindset and skills that are most in demand by employers of the 21st century, and to establish a strategic talent pipeline model, enabling industry, academia, philanthropy, and government to break down the silos and start working together to develop the talent we all need to succeed. What can you do to help open up space as a new frontier for mankind? Are you a university faculty, administrator, or student? A leader in aerospace, tech, or philanthropy? Join us as a member of the Space Challenge. And so, to help us launch today, we've got a very special guest who's joining us. NASA astronaut Leland Melvin. Let me tell you a little, a little bit about him before you clap. Hold on. Leland is the only person drafted into the National Football League who's also flown in space. <laughs> Leland has a bachelor's of science degree in chemistry and a master's degree in materials and, and science engineering. He has flown several missions for NASA. And then after serving his country in that fashion, after hanging up his space boots, he was appointed head of NASA education and served as the co-chair on the White House's federal coordination on the STEM education task force and developed the strategy for STEM education for the, for the overall country. He's got this awesome book that, he's gonna, that uh, I'm going to share with you after his remarks. He's got a National Geographic show that's about to come on. And let me tell you, today, he's here to inspire all of you 
to join the Base 11 Space Challenge. Now get fired up for Leland Murray. Thank you, Landon. Thank you, everyone. I am so inspired to be here because this is what it means, grassroots, community-driven efforts to give experiential learning to our next generation of explorers. When I, when I look at the pictures in this, this museum, I think about my hometown, Lynchburg, Virginia, where I grew up on Pierce Street. And five blocks down the street on Pierce Street was Chauncey Spencer, stand up Chauncey. Chauncey Spencer's father was an aviator who could not fly in the Lynchburg, they, he couldn't take lessons in the Lynchburg airport because the skin color wasn't the right color. So he went to Chicago, learned how to fly, and then went to Washington DC to petition Congress with Harry S. Truman, Senator Harry S. Truman at the time, to get money for African Americans to fly in the military. And so he was setting the groundwork for me to get the space. And when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon in 1969, I was five years old. And everyone watching that television set, rabbit ears, grainy black and white set, all those kids at that time wanted to be astronauts. And they said, Leon, do you want to be an astronaut? No. I didn't see someone who looked like me. And the person I wanted to be was training five blocks down the street from me was Arthur Ashe. I wanted to be a tennis player because he had character, great character, discipline. He was an excellent student and he was winning every tournament known to humankind. So I was gonna be Arthur Ashe. But because my mother gave me an age-inappropriate non-OSHA certified chemistry set, <laughs> I created the most incredible explosion in her living room, burned a hole in her carpet, and that fueled my curiosity to become a scientist, and then an engineer, and then eventually an astronaut to fly in space. So when I think about what Landon and this group at Base 11 is doing to inspire the next generation of explorers by giving these resources for the future of our civilization to have that next step, that next rocket launch, that next moon landing, that next person maybe living on Mars. But it starts right here. And there's a scientific uh, American article that came out, I think in 2013 or 14, that said the best solutions come from the most diverse teams. And I think in that research it showed that if a person in a VP position that happened to be a female on a Wall Street, in a Wall Street company was on that team, that, that company would make $40 million on average more. So it's so important that we ensure that everyone on the team has an opportunity and that all people all genders, all diversities come to the table to create the best solutions. And so I want to thank Landon, I want to thank all the partners here for creating this challenge because a million dollars makes people's eyes get big, right? And how many students do we have in here? Stand up, stand up. The most important thing that you can do with your time right now is to ask yourself, this question. Mark Twain said the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you figure out why. Why were you born? What is your purpose? And so as you go through school, as you work on this challenge, think about your purpose and your why. And as you do that, pull people along with you, middle school kids, high school kids, your friends, your family, and let them know why you exist and why you're building and creating to help advance our civilization. Godspeed in your journey. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this incredible announcement. Thank you, Landon. We got it. Well, hold on right here. Hold on. Come on over here. You want to give Come on over here. I got you some wanna, swag. Yeah, man, with some swag. And then we'll give you the official uh, Space Challenge t-shirt. And then uh, there you go. And then the special, uh, there, you, there you go. Boom on it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> And listen, uh, as you can see, uh, Leland has this awesome book, Chasing Space. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that everybody go get this for yourselves, students, adults. Go ahead and make sure that everyone gets this and supports it. We're going to be tweeting it out everywhere uh, to support Leland. There's a new show uh, that's coming out on National Geographic uh, that's featuring Leland. 
Uh, and so this is really, this is what it's about. This is the image this is th that we want to be able to really show about what's possible. So we were so honored. The last thing I'm going to say, this was not my prepared prepare rem remarks. This space challenge has helped us find out who's real, who's authentic, who's about this work. And when Leland heard about what we were doing, uh, Leland's a professional speaker. He gets paid $25,000 minimum on up for his talks. He heard about this. He says, I'm there. I'm there to support this. I'm in. Give him another round of applause. And let, me, and let me clarify, we're a nonprofit, so we didn't have 25G. So he, he came and did it for us uh, as a part of the cause. So we're fired up about that. Now, I'm excited to introduce our next partner, who really is the, uh, the inspiration of when all the teams get through the gates and they're ready to go launch. Uh, the CEO of Spaceport America uh, is here to give his remarks about the impact of this challenge. Please welcome up Dan Hicks, the CEO of Spaceport America, where this, the rocket is going to go to space. Dan. So what an honor for me to be here today, just following not only these two great gentlemen, but but to talk to you just for a couple seconds about the exciting time that we live in and a historic time that we live in. Let me share a couple thoughts of why I think it's historic uh, times in the space industry and for our country. So the first is we just started the National Space Council. Our leaders in our government, Vice President Pence and all the department secretaries, Commerce, Department of Defense, uh, Transportation, you name it, they started the National Space Council. We haven't had that in 25 years. And they started that for a reason, because what they did is they got input from the industry, from academia, from, from uh, the civil space and security space and commercial space industry. And they realized that as a nation, to be world leaders again in space exploration, they had to do something. So that's the first thing that's historic, because they came out with a policy that says very quickly we're going to go to the moon with a permanent presence in a few years, and then we're going to go on to Mars and other deep space exploration while we still continue as a nation to lead the world in so many other venues of space exploration, but it's a clear policy and it excites us to think about that. Just think about being an uh, interplanetary species in a few years from now. That's exciting and to be able to be in the presence of, of great astronauts like, like Leland. And then the second perspective that I think is historic is the timing of, of funding. So you think back in the Apollo days, right? And Gemini and Mercury, all that was a big space race between a couple big nations, and it was all government-funded activity. Today, that's different. Today, we have, Landon talked about the $2.7 trillion that's going to be spent in a few years. 75% of that is by these visionaries, these entrepreneurial spirits around the world that are doing really cool things, whether it's Sir Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit and the Spaceship Company, which is our foundational partner out at the, out at the Spaceport America, or whether it's a... Blue Origin and SpaceX and the cool things they're doing with returnable boosters and reusable technologies, how exciting that is. Or whether it's Boeing, you know, space giant like Boeing that does incredible things for security and commercial and, and, and wonderful things of, uh, they're developing a space plane uh, today. They're doing things like the CST Starliner, which actually lifts off from Spaceport and they're testing a the drogue shoot out there with our partnership at White Sands. There's so many exciting activities going on around the world, but I think it's historic because it's not just taxpayer dollars that's doing all this right now. And that's, anytime you have a sector that's going like that, then it's gonna be sustaining and it'll be long-term and lasting. So let me transition to, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I get to operate Spaceport America. I've got one of the most talented management teams and a great staff of, of any spaceport in the universe, uh, with, without a doubt. These guys are awesome. And we have not only a really great team of people but we also have some natural attributes of a high altitude, of beautiful sunny weather, of, of a very benign weather environment, of dealing in a very sparse population, which allows us to do things that you can't do in many other places in the world. And because we have not only those natural attributes, but we also have one other key ingredient, that's airspace. Unlimited airspace from surface to unlimited that's restricted and controlled by the Department of Defense with the full authority of the FAA. So we have access to space that we can do things that you really have a hard time doing at other places in the nation. And that's why 
place, the uh, Experimental Sand and Rocket Association This uh, that started an IRAC competition, Intercollegiate Rocket Engineering Competition, started about 14 years ago. Last year, they grew from 35, 40 teams to 91 teams that came, 116 registered. These are students that are competing with rocketry at 10 and 30,000 feet. So that's just low altitude compared to what we're getting ready to do, but they could do it at a place at Spaceport America. And so that third week in June, it's coming up again, where we have 133 teams from around the world coming to compete. That's also why we have New Mexico Tech, Princeton, Purdue, and many of these other universities come out to Spaceport, because we have these natural attributes where they can launch up to higher altitudes. So when I first met Landon a little while ago in September, and we talked about this, it's like, well, you're gonna need a place to do this safely. You're gonna need a place that you have access to space. And so for those same attributes that not only support academia and these other competitions, for the same reasons, Landon and I instantly hit it on. But it wasn't just because we have the ability to go to the Carmen line to do this wonderful million dollar challenge with liquid rockets. But what really struck me the most, and this is a reflection of the leadership in New Mexico from Governor Martinez down to the legislatures as they work, what really impressed me the most about this partnership is that we have the ability to make a difference in STEM, and not just to make a difference to get more STEM, but to do so in an area that's under-resourced but high talent. So coming from southern New Mexico, this is an area that is key to us going forward. It's what we're gonna have to do to get more women and minorities, to make our teams more diverse, just like Leland mentioned. That's gonna be critical for us as a society to go forward and accomplish great dreams. And so we are so excited to have these university teams and all you students out there come in a few years when you get your liquid rocket capabilities designed, built, and ready to go to have you come out to Spaceport America. And Landon, thank you for the courage and what you're doing and for letting us partner with you on this wonderful challenge. God bless you and for all the students out here, good luck. We wish to look forward to see you. Thank you. And it's so important to have um, partners. And what I also want to mention is not only industry partners, but government partners. And I've already mentioned a couple that were here, but also Bishop uh, L.J. Guillory, wave your hand, he's in the back. He's uh, one of our government partners from local. And Councilwoman Emma Sharif is also here. And so it's so important, there she is, it's so important to have our support uh, from our government partners. And so thank you for that. Now we wanna give you a very special message. I told you about how we got inspired by the X Prize. Well, one of our collaborators, uh, the XPRIZE Foundation, co-founder of the XPRIZE himself, Peter Diamandis. Listen. Hi, I'm Diane Murphy, and I was one of the three people on the founding team of the X Prize, and today I have the honor of being up on the Board of Trustees. So in 2004, as Peter explained, we made history because we'd offered a prize for the first private team, not government, to send a spacecraft to the edge of space. 
And today we're here because we're gonna make history again by breaking the next barrier, which is gonna allow all these students and more to take their spacecrafts to the edge of space. So what many of you may not know is that the X Prize almost didn't happen. Many, many times it almost didn't happen because there were no rules. This had never been done before. There were no, no spaceports, no regulations, no rules. And so usually, you know, typically when that happens in government, they just shut it down. But not in this case, because there was one federal agency who stood up and took the lead in this, and that was the Office of Commercial Space Transportation of the Federal Aviation Administration. And today, we're gonna hear from Michelle Murray, around the corner here, um, who is a leader in that office. And uh, she is a one amazing person. She is an engineer, she is a mother, she has worked at Lockheed Martin and with NASA, and now she's been at AST for 15 years, and she's probably the best person I can think of who will be the best role model for all the women who are gonna be part of the teams that are gonna be the next spacecraft designers, builders, launchers, and pilots. So Michelle? Hi everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, most folks, I, I have not been in a, an audience where the word commercial space have been used so much. Uh, so I usually introduce myself and say I'm from the FAA's Office of Commercial Space and then go on to explain there's three sectors to the space industry. The military, NASA, and commercial space. And the FAA regulates commercial space. We license uh, launch vehicles, reentry vehicles, and the operation of spaceports like Dan's. And um, we also have a mission besides protecting the public and property and national security and uh, things like that. We also have a, a mission to encourage, facilitate, and promote the industry. So yes, we are there to stand up and help commercial space. Uh, there are many wonderful things about the Base 11 Challenge. Um, one that stands out to me the most is that it's designed to give the next generation of workforce a hands-on experience where safety is the top priority. Uh, that is the reason why they've, been, they've met with us, we're working with their teams, because they understand the important value of safety. Uh, space is inherently risky, and the future of the industry and commercial space industry is gonna depend on the industry's ability to continually improve its safety performance. This is why the safety first mindset is so important. The FAA will be working with the Base 11 Organization Safety Council and the students to ensure that the launches from Spaceport America will be done meeting FAA requirements and be conducted safely. Um, this challenge will be conducted under the FAA's uh, high power amateur rocketry regulations under part 101 and they will be conducted from a licensed spaceport, Spaceport America. On a personal level, I'm very excited to be here because I share Base 11's mission uh, to increase the STEM talent into the aerospace workforce and into commercial space uh, for those women and underrepresented folks and minorities. So we're really excited to have those folks come into the commercial space industry. And I really hope that uh, this challenge, is particularly its outreach components, do attract more women and minorities into aerospace. They have so much value to add, and we really need to uh, recognize that talent, nurture it, and bring them into the aerospace workforce. So I look forward to working with Base 11, uh, the, the, the Safety Council, and the students to ensure that we have a safe and successful challenge. Michelle was amazing when we uh, first met with her. She was like, this, first of all, this is awesome. Uh, and uh, we were like, I don't know if you knew this, but we were kind of had our fingers crossed when we were starting the call. We were like, either Michelle's going to shut us down or she's going to be like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, she gave us a point person to work with. And, they, and FAA has just been amazing. So students, we've been working for you guys because you know you, you need this approval. So we've been working for you. Listen, now I get a chance to introduce uh, 
one of my great friends, uh, an incredible partner uh, with Base 11 overall for the last uh, few years. And when I told him about the Space Challenge and I said, listen, but we, we've got, we already have the million dollar prize all funded, that's done. We've got our project, that's done. But we need some additional help and support so we can make sure that this gets brought to all communities and all students. So step up and be a sponsor with us. And he was like, you know what? Highest level, chairman circle. I want to introduce you to my friend, the SVP for Dusso Systems, the president of their foundation, Al Bunchak. Thank you, Landon. What an exciting day. Uh, I'm just honored to be here and representing our company here with everyone. We in our company recognize that it is absolutely an imperative that we inspire and motivate the next generation. We make the tools, the software tools that the aerospace industry depends on and many, many other industries to develop and drive their innovations. And so we have committed ourselves as a company to put what we call the workforce of the future as a strategic pillar for where our company is going. And I'm honored to lead that activity here in North America. This is aligned to our corporate strategy and so we've been investing heavily in STEM education and I, I just wanna make two points about it and we've touched on these points already. First of all, I've been involved for about eight years now in a national STEM task force activity where for a number of years I was the co-chair. We did a lot of research into STEM education, uh, 40 employers from all range of industries in terms of what is that gap that exists between what we need and what education is delivering. And the single most powerful element of filling that gap and giving young people the skills they need, and you touched on it, Leland, experiential learning. Industry-driven, unstructured problems. Hey, in the real world, the answer is not in the back of the book. Um, in the real world, it's our challenge and requirement to take a step beyond what's ever been done before, and that's what we expect these student, student teams to do. So this will give students, and where they want it, under the mentorship of industry leaders who've done it before, uh, a real hands-on experiential learning opportunity. Second is diversity. It's absolutely an essential for our economy, for our communities, for our country, for our nation. But the point I want to make to all of you is that it is a business imperative. And if you're not familiar with the work of Scott Page, I encourage you to take a look at his book. Uh, I believe it's his most recent book, which is titled The Diversity Bonus. And in that book, he shares research that proves that you can choose a team of your absolute top performing all-stars from your organization, and you can choose another team randomly from your organization, and this random team will outperform the stars. Why? Because they bring what he refers to as cognitive diversity. They come with different points of view, different angles, different experiences, and that drives innovation. And so again, driving more diversity in our ecosystems, in our companies, whether it be in government, whether it be in education, whether it be in our businesses, is an absolute imperative. So our commitment to the Base 11 Space Challenge is that we are um, giving our software platform, which is called the 3D Experience Platform, to any and all of the teams who wish to utilize it. This is an industry-leading set of tools, design, analysis, manufacturing, et cetera. That platform will be used also as a judging platform. Uh, and importantly, students can use that platform to maintain and store their work, their digital portfolio. It's one thing to have a resume like this, and it's a whole nother to be able to demonstrate your work, uh, your real engineering work. So we look forward to what the teams will do. I'm absolutely convinced that there's gonna be incredible innovation that comes from this project. We're honored to be part of this, and I'd like to share with you now a very brief video from the Managing Director of North America for Dasso Systems, Dean Marsh. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dean Marsh. Managing Director for Dasso System here in North America. I am so excited to be partnering with Base 11 for the Space Challenge. You know, growing up, I was inspired to become an engineer and a computer scientist by the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon. And I am certain that this million dollar student-led challenge will inspire the next generation of engineers and scientists. 
Here at Dassault System, we have been working strategically to link industry with academia to create meaningful projects that help prepare students for their eventual work and careers. I know that if we expose more students to these types of projects, we will inspire more of you to pursue careers in the STEM fields. We see the Base 11 Space Challenge as a perfect fit for helping to achieve that objective, to prepare qualified talent for the aerospace industry while generating fresh new ideas. So I invite you to take up that challenge. Show us what you've got. Good luck to all of the student teams, and I hope to see you on the launch pad with a million dollar check. Thank you. So what I love about that is again, walking the talk. Um, you see, um, senior, basically managing director of all of, North, of the North Americas for Dusso Systems, um, African American male. And so that's in essence kind of walking the talk. And Al, we appreciate you for your leadership and your commitment uh, to this space. So thank you for that. Now, let's get to the details. Uh, my wife was like, yeah, let's get to the details. Come on, Landon. <laughs> let's get to the details of what the meat of the challenge, okay? So that you can know. Leland was asking me out front, give me the details about the challenge. So we're going to walk you through it as a team. First of all, these are the prizes. Now, we talked about the one million, but guess what, students? We also have prizes leading up to it in phases. So phase number one is the overall program design. So the teams will have between now, when we open this up, until March of 2019 to put together their program design, which includes the design of their rocket, but also their outreach and diversity strategy to diversify their teams, and their safety, Michelle, their safety plan. So that'll all be that'll all be uh, put together in terms of what that overall program design. And you'll see a bucket of 50,000 first, second, and third prize for that. Then next, the following year, phase two, another $50,000 for the, the, the best static fire test. Then number three, we're gonna have pop-up innovation challenges all along the way, where we'll just surprise you and say, here's a pop-up challenge. And the first pop-up challenge we're announcing today, any student, from anywhere in the United States or Canada can enter this, even if you're not in the Space Challenge. We want you to help us design the logo for the Space Challenge. $2,500 prize to be able to design the logo so anybody can enter into that. I'm going to have Christine now walk you through the details of the timeline. All right, thank you. So registration for the Base 11 Space Challenge is open now. I'm actually already getting some notifications that people are signing up. Registration closes September 28th. We've done our best to ensure that the challenge follows the flow of the academic year. For the first year, everyone moves at the same pace. As Landon mentioned, your rocket designs, plans for safety, outreach, and business development are all part of phase one. Those are due next March to 2019. Uh, some of you may have attended the Aerospace Expo that Base 11 hosted with Dassault Systems at UCI last fall. We're gonna be having another Aerospace Expo a year from now, right back here at tomorrow's Aeronautical Museum, where we'll be announcing the winners of phase one of the challenge. Now, after that point, some teams might start moving faster than others. So while deadlines continue generally to be in the spring, if, you, if your team is ready and you submit early, the judges will review it and move you on to the next phase. So to that end, there are four launch windows, the earliest being in May of 2020, and subsequent ones in December of 2020, May 2021, and December of 2021. Now, I would like to take a moment to talk about safety. At least 20 uh, university teams in the US and Canada are already experimenting with liquid fuel rocketry. And some of them enjoy tremendous support from faculty experts as well as industry mentors, but not all of them do. So one of the goals of this challenge has been to introduce some safety standards across all of the teams. To that end, we formed a safety advisory council that's responsible for three things. One is having written guidelines, safety guidelines. The other is advising on an in-person safety training that will be mandatory for the safety officers on each team and overseeing the creation of an online safety training that all team members will need to complete. 
The Safety Advisory Council is comprised of current and retired employees of these organizations, SpaceX, Aerojet Rocketdyne, Boeing, Friends of Amateur Rocketry, Spaceport America, and Pratt and & Whitney. And as you heard Michelle mention, the FAA is also involved, as is NASA. Um, although each of these members is, um, brings a very different expertise and different perspectives, they share one thing in common, which is their absolute commitment to making this a safe and educational experience for the students. Now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Kyla Jeffrey of HeroX. Uh, she, they work on um, crowdsourcing challenges for NASA, Boeing, Coca-Cola, and many others, and we've been very honored to have them work on our challenge. Kyla? Thank you so much, Christine. So five years ago, Peter Diamandis, who we heard from earlier, co-founded HeroX with CEO Christian Cotacini as a spin-off of the X Prize. And the reason we did this is because at our core, we believe that any problem that we face in the world, we can employ the world to solve it. And that's exactly what we're doing here with the Base 11 Space Challenge. So I want to take a moment and introduce you to the Space Challenge page on HeroX, which will be the hub, the community, for this challenge. Students, this is where you'll find all the information you need to register, all the information you need throughout the competition. And for everyone else, this is where you can stand behind our student teams, you can congratulate them on the forum, you can cheer them on, you can get their updates throughout the progress. And this will really be the core and the community that we're building around the Space Challenge. So I encourage everyone at the end of this presentation to go sign up and follow along. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce a special announcement by the first Latino NASA astronaut. Million Dollar Space Challenge. Hi, I'm Franklin Chang Diaz. I'm currently the founder and the CEO of Ad Astra Rocket Company. And in 1980, I was fortunate to become NASA's first Latino astronaut. The $1 million Base 11 Space Challenge is an amazing way to infuse the younger generation with that Apollo space fever. That space fever was what motivated an entire country, let alone the whole world, to push themselves to explore the unknown, to create the unheard of, and to accomplish what seemed to be impossible. Now, 50 years have passed since we last visited the moon. In that half century, we have made much progress, but it is time to pass the torch to a new generation to take us further, faster, into the depth of space. And that generation is you. It is about our survival as a species, a space-faring species. And you are the fresh air that will rekindle the fire of creativity, innovation, and of advanced technology. But only if you work hard and help one another. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, your possibilities are endless. That is, if you're passionate, open-minded, and determined. So good luck to all the teams competing for the prize. But remember, knowledge and experience are the best prizes of all. Thank you. So you continue to see the, the message weaving, right, breaking down those silos. Another representative from, from NASA, uh, industry. And I failed to mention, when I talked about those companies, another company that's here with us is Virgin Orbit. Um, and so I want to recognize my man from Virgin Orbit. So, so no students uh, that we've got them all, we've, we've got everyone here. Now, uh, I want to switch to academia. Um, and uh, I want to bring up two leaders. Um, we, you know our focus is on not, all, not only getting to space, but also diversity and diversifying this, uh, this field. And so, in essence, uh, Sigma Pi Phi fraternity uh, which you, you'll hear about just about a moment in just, in just a second, um, is really focused on really helping um, African-American males in a, in a real big effort to be able to come and advance 
uh, in STEM. And so the national president, Wes Coleman, is here. And then also um, Dr. Antoine Garibaldi, who's the president of Uni University of Detroit Mercy, is here and is going to give remarks about uh, this effort together. So gentlemen, bring, come, come right up. Good morning, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, as Landon said, I'm Antoine Garibaldi, president of University of Detroit Mercy, and also a member of Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, which is more popularly known as the Boule, and happens to be the oldest African-American fraternity in this country that was begun in 1904. I'm very pleased to represent Sigma Pi Phi fraternity here, along with our national president, Wes Coleman, and specifically the members of the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Committee. Many of our more than 5,000 members uh, are in this organization, and a good number of them from this geographic area have also joined us today. And uh, as I said, Wes Coleman and also Landon Taylor, the CEO of Base 11, is also one of our distinguished members. And I'll speak in a few minutes about why we are here. As a lifelong teacher and administrator in elementary, junior, and senior high schools, as well as colleges and universities, I cannot stress enough the importance and urgency of preparing all young men and women to be proficient in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And these young men and women involved in STEM education must come from all racial and economic groups, as well as ethnic backgrounds, too. Historically, we know that our scientific leaders have come from many different communities, irrespective of their parents' education and financial resources. But when given the chance to learn and the opportunities to dream and succeed, those aspiring scientists exceeded all expectations. This Base 11 Space Challenge is equally inspirational for our youth, and this dynamic collaboration of elementary and secondary schools, colleges, and universities Space exploration companies, the FAA, Sigma Pi Phi, and other groups will literally propel our next generation of liquid fuel rocket tree leaders. And I know my own students at University of Detroit Mercy, as well as the faculty, are equally excited about this too. But another part of my role here today is to promote the importance of historically black colleges and universities, becoming more involved in aerospace and also other STEM fields. I'm a graduate of Howard University, one of the historically black colleges and universities, and 21 of my 42 years as a professor and senior administrator at both Xavier University of Louisiana and also Howard University, I know the significant contributions that HBCUs have made to the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics over the last 170 years. And as I documented more than 34 years ago in my 1984 book, Black Colleges and Universities, Challenges for the Future, HBCUs have educated many of the African-American scientists and professional leaders because of the segregation that existed in the majority of the nation's 4,000 colleges and universities. A large number of those African-American scientific leaders were graduates of HBCUs, but they were also members of Sigma Pi Phi and received their bachelor's, master's, first professional degrees, as well as doctorates at many of those schools. Today, there are more than 100 historically black colleges and universities, and Sigma Pi Phi is looking forward to announcing a major partnership with Base 11 at our biennial convention in Chicago in Cincinnati on June the 24th. Through this partnership, we'll be able to involve many HBCU students and area institutions in an exciting space challenge competition that will assist their institutions and also generate more interest in pursuing and considering more opportunities in the aerospace workforce. HBCUs have provided exceptional talent over the years in each of those STEM fields for many decades, and this collaboration will assure that these institutions continue to play a very significant role in the production of more aerospace workforce. So we're very, very excited to be a part of this extraordinary and historic initiative, and uh, our national leader, Wes Coleman, will say a few words as well. Good morning. I also am a proud graduate of, a, of, a, of an HBCU, Hampton University in Virginia. And 
It is really great that we are able to partner with Base 11 on this very exciting project. I heard a lot about inspiring our youth today, and that just happens to be the theme of our current biennium, inspiring our youth to succeed. So all across the country, our 5,000 members are doing things in their communities to inspire our youth to achieve their potential. And just in closing, I had lunch with Landon about two years ago, and as we were talking, he had a certain gleam in his eyes. He was telling, thinking about what he was planning to do with Base 11, and I knew it was gonna be something innovative and challenging. Didn't have any idea it was gonna be quite like this, but he is a true visionary, and we are very pleased to partner with him. Thank you. And to continue with our leaders uh, from academia, Dr. Goshani, the Dean of Engineering for Cal State University, Long Beach, and one of the first to say, we're in, and I think we're gonna win this thing. Dr. Goshani. Good morning, everyone, and I'm humbled to share the stage with uh, such uh, luminaries and uh, leaders, uh, President Garibaldi. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of the program. Uh, fortuitously, yesterday in the mail, I, I received a packet from a friend, and in that packet, there were several objects, including this book, The Space and Beyond. Uh, and on top, it says, choose your own adventure. And I'm glancing through this, and it's a very, very interesting book, and it gives you options to go different directions. And you know where it uh, points you to? is inclusiveness and where you fail, where you divide it. And you know, I'm thinking of the location where this announcement is being made. I've had the privilege of being here in this uh, Tomorrow's Aviation Museum before and what great programming, what great opportunity to involve the community. So uh, thank you, Landon, for this choice. This is great. I, uh, my university is very fortunate to be in the city of Long Beach, probably the most diverse city in the nation, believe it or not. And we pride ourselves <laughs> for having no barriers. Uh, of the 1,300 uh, engineers we graduated this year, a majority of them are from underrepresented groups. So I'm very, very pleased to uh, be able to say this, that we truly make it easy for all demographics to come pursue engineering, and in fact, we have specific programming to enable them to succeed. And many of these programs are indeed uh, sponsored by companies that are represented here. We, with Boeing, we have had many years of partnership. They have a presence in our college as well as many other companies. Uh, a partner, a recent partner for us is the uh, National College Resource Foundation that was mentioned, and they have sponsored our current uh, rocket, uh, uh, I'm sorry, liquid propelled uh, rocket program. And this is uh, a program that we are hoping to result in a launch in about uh, less than two weeks and this will push the limit for us to uh, the limit of uh, civilian space, about 45,000 feet, which is a good, good new height for us. We have been launching rockets for uh, 15 years, liquid prepared rockets, so this is a new high for us. About six months ago or so, inspired by Foster, who is in the audience, uh, I set a challenge for our students to be the first university to launch a rocket to low Earth orbit by 2025. A few months later, I meet Landon, and well, our timeline just pushed back, I came forward just a bit, so we will uh, align ourselves to meet this challenge. Thank you for that. And, uh, with the sponsorship and resources that uh, we have received, we are able to provide a space for this rocket team. 
that is uh, a magnet for high schools and middle schools. So again, we will be able to meet uh, the challenge of uh, including young women and men from all walks of life to be part of this exciting program. Let me go back to this and read from the last page of this book, which says, uh, it says, beware and warning, you and you alone are in charge. The last sentence is the following, you will travel through time, but be careful, you might end up stuck in a void where time no longer exists, and thus neither do you. So uh, prophetic. It's all about students, and uh, I wish you well. Our students will be along with you competing, and let's hear from the students. Hybrid rockets, we build that. Oh. Canadian altitude record, we break that. Oh. Liquid engine space shot, we win that. Oh. And I'm Hubert. And we're the captains of UBC Rocket. We are UBC Rocket Chief. Says at UCSD. UBC Irvine. RPL at UCSD. Based in Florida from Montreal, Canada. We are the new Rocket Team and we're excited. We're excited. We're excited. For the base 11. Base 11. For the base 11. Base 11. Base 11. Base 11. Base 11. Hi, my name is Christian Nilsson and I am the president of Purdue's Rocket Club. Purdue's extremely excited to compete in the Base 11 Challenge. Uh, from the first to the very most recent steps in the moon, Purdue has a rich history of spaceflight. And our alumni has gone on to do great things, but now it is the student's turn to make their mark and move the world forward for space exploration. And we're excited to partner with Purdue's Polytechnic High School, a high school located in the heart of Indianapolis, to give the low resource students that they access to their first small step to make the next giant leap to mankind. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Shin. I'm the co-founder and the chief business development officer at Space Enterprise at Berkeley. I'm here at the Base 11 kickoff with my fellow colleague and co-founder, Eric Bly over there, and also our chief engineer at our team. Uh, I just want to start off by saying that uh, UC Berkeley and the student community overall across the nation and the world is incredibly thankful for Base 11 for recognizing this feat that has not been done to get into space uh, by students alone is, uh, is a legitimate uh, task that is uh, worth uh, taking. Uh, and with that, I do have to say that Base 11 actually came in during a time, I would have to say, is uh, pre pretty uh, serendipitous, I would say. Uh, space Enterprise at Berkeley has started working on their liquid propulsed uh, Eureka 1 rocket since July of 2017. Uh, several months after we've heard about uh, Base 11's contributions to various academic institutions at the Southern California region, and we've contacted Base 11 without uh, the, with knowing that Base 11 was working on the Space Challenge alone. And uh, uh, after reaching out to Base 11 without getting a response from two weeks later, uh, suddenly I get a response from Christine, who is the communication director, saying that they have uh, not only supported, or, or not only going to support the, the space uh, uh, endeavor, but also will be the sole industry legitimizer for uh, this feat. And once again, UC Berkeley and the student community is incredibly thankful for Base 11 for opening and kicking off this challenge uh, for the entire world. Thank you very much. All right, we are at the close. So as we get ready to wrap up, um, You've got to, we got to acknowledge those who has made this thing possible, right? And so there's a few people I've got to acknowledge, if you can hold tight with me. The very first who tolerates me and gives me energy and makes my uh, wings fly is my amazing, incredible wife, Michelle Flowers Taylor. So please recognize her.
One guy I gotta actually bring up is Robin Petgrave. Robin, come on up here. So Robin Petgrave. Come on over here. Uh, Rob, this is his space. Um, and you've seen this amazing things, and you're gonna be able to see it and tour it inside. But Robin, just thank you for your amazing leadership. And uh, I just want you, since this is your house, um, I just want you to be able to just say uh, a word that you'd like to be able to say about what's happening here. So <clears throat> I'm sure there are skeptics that look at this and say, you want to get young people, you keep talking about this innovation, and you know, how do you know it really works, right? Um, <clears throat> we had uh, UCLA launch in that last competition, and how do you know it really works? Well, <clears throat> we built this rocket lab here so kids could get exposed to um, a aerospace. And on that big rocket table out there, you'll actually see a layup of a space-capable rocket that our high school students and some of the engineering volunteers and mentors, including this guy that works on the Boeing space plane, have been working on. But how does it work? I had a Caltech moment. Um, I got a call that some kids was playing around with this, this thing that they were they made, and I got on the phone, and I was like, what is going on? And here, stand up, young man. Come on up here. Yeah, so this is one of our FLARE students, which stands for Future Leaders of Advanced Rocket Engineering. He's an 11th grader. Um, he got this great idea from test firing our rocket engine on our test stand out there. And they dug in their pockets, him and one of the other Flair students, went to the Dollar Tree store, which is like the 99 cent store, and bought some parts and assembled a liquid fuel rocket engine that actually works. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is 11th grade making his own prototype of a liquid fueled rocket engine that works. What is he going to do when he gets to be you? Innovation starts here. This works proof positive. And you uh, recruiters, get his name and phone number. <laughs> you want him on your team. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming down. I hope you like my spot. And uh, good luck, everybody. We're going to win. No. <laughs>